Uh, so as Greg mentioned, my name is Rachel Owen. I'm a doctoral candidate here um, in natural resources, and I study soil ecology, but that's just a way to say soil health, I think, in natural ecosystems. Um, and I'm excited to be here today to um, lead this panel discussion. We've got three great panelists here. Um, first, we have Francis Thickey, and he's joining us from Fairfield, Iowa. He runs an organic row crop and dairy operation there. Um, we also have Josh Payne, and he's here from Concordia, Missouri. Um, he's a former Eng English teacher um, and recently has moved back and started working on his family farm again. And then we also have Debbie Course, and she's here from Charleston, Missouri, and she'll be able to talk about um, her row crop operation and then some of the um, conservation management that they've incorporated there. Um, so before we take questions, um, we're first going to have each of the panelists give about a five-minute talk about their, the nature of their farms, size, uh, the crops that you have, any other commodities that you have on your farms, um, and then also why you got interested in incorporating soil health and how you see that um, as a part of your farm. So Francis, would you like to start? Testing, one, two, no. Thank you. As mentioned, <coughs> excuse me, I got something in my throat today. Um, I have a crop and dairy farm. We milk about 90 cows, and we have about 730 acres that we do some cropping on. It's all organic. Um, I, I moved to this farm in 1996, started with 176 acres. And this land had been in corn and soybeans for many years, and um, it tilled constantly. And it was hilly land for in southern Iowa. And um, it was really badly eroded. Some places, all the topsoil was gone. The A horizon was gone down at farming the subsoil. And, and the waterways had gullies up to four feet deep. So we, we, we patched those gullies and we planted the whole farm into a diverse mix of grasses and, and clovers and, um, for grazing and set up 60 paddocks. So the cows get fresh grass twice a day after each milking and they move around. So we like to let the grass regrow and, and then, um, of course, grow a root system to help build the soil. There are three principles that I, I like to, to, to think about as I, for my cropping and grazing system. One is that um, to have something on the ground all the time, cover on the land all the time. The second thing is to till as little as possible. And the third thing is much diversity as possible. And of course, within each of these, you can, you can max optimize as well. Um, so on our grazing area, I think we have a pretty decent system for rebuilding the soil, and we're starting to see it come back. And I, I like to let the grass grow a little taller if I can, so I get deeper roots and, and, and um, get more mass growing in the soil, more carbon in the soil. Um, now, in the cropping system, what I've been doing more recently is uh, using a roll-down cover crop, planting a cover crop like rye, rolling that down in the spring, and then planting a crop like soybeans into it. And um, I, I see I'm just getting started on that because I, over time, bought more land and, and added to the, to the farm size. So I'm just getting going on the cropping, but I'm very excited about that as, a, as an option. Always having something in the ground, rolling down cover crops, letting them grow tall, six, seven feet tall cover crops, rolling them down flat. And after the soybeans are harvested in, in the fall, you still have that mass on the ground. So it, I think it's a quick way to really build soil um, health. Thanks, Francis. It's, uh, it's fun to hear some connections there as I talk. I'm, I'm not an organic farmer. I farm probably 60 miles to the west of here in a town called Concordia. Um, I actually, I used to be an English teacher. Um, I farm with my 90-year-old grandfather right now, um, and it truly is a partnership. It's a fun, it's kind of a fun deal. It's not just me saying something and, or him saying. We, we get to make these decisions together, and as of about five years ago, it was, it was kind of like your farm, Francis. It was, uh, it, was com it was completely tilled. It was conventionally tilled, and it was a straight corn and soy rotation. Um, now, our farm looks very different. Um, we've experimented with integrating some livestock from different places, um, thanks to actually several people in this crowd who've told me that I should do that. Um, we, have a, we do a four-way rotation. We have corn, 
Um, we follow corn up with cereal rye, just like you're talking about. We roll it down in the spring. We, we plant green into that, um, which enables us to only use the uh, chemical clethodum, actually, um, to kill it to, uh, as a grass herbicide. So then we plant and we use one post, one post application of um, some kind of a bro uh, broad spectrum herbicide. So then we're, we have corn, rye, we've reduced our chemicals into soybeans. So we have corn, soy, we've flipped that around and do soy because I like to make money and wheat doesn't make much money. And then we follow that up um, and we, we, play, we plant wheat. We follow wheat with a big biodiverse um, um, cover crop mix, which we then graze sometimes depending upon where we are. And then we flip that whole, uh, flip that whole cycle. Um, kind of the fun thing, I've got to know some people here at the Agroforestry Academy. This next year we're gonna do some alley cropping. We're gonna plant some chestnut trees. Um, some cider apple trees, and we're also going to um, steal a page from J. Russell Smith's um, tree crop book, and we're going to plant a big silvo pasture um, that's going to be kind of based upon that and offer some grazing options because my grandfather took out all our trees about 60 years ago, so we have no shade, no fences, any of that, th any of that stuff. So I like to have kind of a launching spot. My favorite question is actually why do you why do you start doing cover crops? It's a really interesting intersection between GPS technology and um, extreme nerdiness in a realm of theology. Um, so I was, my my uh, my tractors now drive themselves, right? And so that allows me to read books and. Um, while I'm driving tractors, and one day I was reading this book by a theologian named N.T. Wright, who talks about this, per, um, like the purpose that we have as people, uh, um, and, and our and our role of bringing health and healing and restoration um, into the the systems that we're in, um, and so that. I realized I was in this tractor and I realized I have this really important job and it's not just about making money, it's also bringing health and healing and restoration to the soil there. So that's, um, that's, been, a good, that's been a good entrance into um, cover crops. It got me started and it actually kind of propels me and keeps me going even when there's failures or something doesn't work, so. I come from a farm in southeast Missouri, char down by Charleston. We're about three miles from the Mississippi River. My grandfather settled this farm in 1911, so we're over a century farm. Uh, my husband and I graduated from the University of Missouri and had thought about going on in academia, but my dad wanted to retire from the farming operation, so we thought, why not? And, and at that time, soybean prices were pretty high, so we, so we did that in 1974. Um, of course, we, we inherited a lot of uh, old-style farming practices with, uh, you know, just tilling, tilling, tilling to get rid of the, the weeds. And, and we, later on in 1991, um, we decided we would go the no-till route. So we've been no-tilling on 780 acres f since that time and have seen a lot of benefits from that. Uh, we also have 100 acres of woods on, on this 1,000-acre farm and uh, have... All, th all of our generations have saved that woods, and we, it's a, it's a swampland mainly, and a lot of it had to be drained, so we saved that, that woods that we didn't drain, and we have a lot of hard woods, and we really enjoy our woods on that property. Uh, we've had cover crops on our farm for about seven years. Now my son farms uh, that farm. He's a fourth generation, and he is 100% cover crop right now, and as I said, we've seen a lot of benefits from that. The no-till is, is not pretty farming. My dad, when we first started doing it, he said it's ugly farming uh, because he was so used to seeing that worked up dirt, which is so pretty and smells so good. But it, it saves not only in cost, because the machinery you have to have and have to use and diesel you have to put in it uh, to go over that ground over and over, uh, that's, you, make, you make more money by doing no-till. I think we have seen some years some increase in our yields, but that's not the main reason we do it. Uh, you know, if it's, if it's the same yield that we still think we, we're, we're, we're gaining some, something. Since about six years ago, we retired from that operation and decided we wanted to, to raise cattle. So we bought a farm in Wayne County, um, and we've learned a lot about raising cattle. We have 600 acres of 300 acres of pasture. We have 36 paddocks. We do the rotational grazing. And I think we've brought a lot of our knowledge from the row crop farming to the pasture health. Uh, we really have, s we bought it, when we bought it, it was terribly overgrazed, ugly. The cows were in the creeks. I thought we'd made a huge mistake. But with the help of all the, the government agencies, we have fenced out all our creeks. 
and we've have we've uh, planted 14,000 thousand trees for the riparian barriers and we've seen a large improvement in our in our pasture land so I have asked I have some some aspects of both types of farming to that I've learned about thank you all for that my microphone's not working now either well, I was going to go back to Debbie because you had the microphone, but now we'll come back down here to Francis. Um, so all three of you have cattle in your operations, um, but Francis, you specifically have a dairy cattle operation. Could you talk to us in just a little bit more detail about why you decided to go with dairy ca cattle and um, how that works both in the pasture rotation, but also um, in your management rotation? They require a lot of um, time from my understanding. Well, I grew up on a dairy farm in Minnesota, Minnesota, and uh, um, and then I went off to school. I became, became a soil scientist and worked as a bureaucrat in Washington for a while at USDA, and then came back farming. Actually, um, the farm that we bought in Iowa, it was at that time the only farm in Iowa that processed milk on the farm, so they bottled milk on the farm, and that's kind of got my interest. It was a little ahead of the curve, and it was in the 1990s, early 1990s, and one of my colleagues at USDA when I left, an economist, he took me aside and said, everybody's quitting that on-farm processing. This is going to be a disaster. But anyway, it's worked out well for us, and, and um, we marketed all locally, basically. But um, the key thing, I think, with a grazing dairy farm is to, to try to make it very efficient so that we have lanes, and all we have to do after each milking is drive up with the four-wheeler and open the next gate, and the cows, they follow us out. They know they're going to get fresh grass. Sometimes they run for it. And, and then they go in, we close the gate, they harvest their own feed, they spread their own manure right where it needs to be, and, and they, they enjoy their work. And so, um, it, 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 so the thing is that you make them do all the work, and then we come back in the, in, in the evening, we open the gate, and they follow us home, and we milk them. So the key thing is we're always looking for ways to make it more efficient so we can um, um, not have much more to do to manage it. And now, as I have more cropping land, I'm trying to integrate the cover crops into grazing so I can graze them some and then use them also in cropping. So that's going to be kind of fun to work on that. Now we'll, s oh, oh, we have a second working microphone. All right. <laughs> um, so Josh, you also mentioned um, that you have recently planted chestnut trees and you're going to be starting a little bit more um, agroforestry practices. Um, so could you talk to us a little bit? I think that that's a unique perspective that you might have here that the group might like to hear is on why you decided to start growing tree crops and um, how they work in your management. Yeah, so that's that's not actually quite true. <laughs> um, we were supposed to plant trees this last year, and we had a equip grant through the NRCS. And my grandfather, I remember eighty nine, um, he vetoed it like after it went through the whole process. So we were supposed to have trees this last year. Now we're in the process of doing that again. But the fun thing is, it's been a chance to really build consensus between myself and my grandpa. And I also got to meet some really neat people. I got there's actually several people here in an uh, agroforestry academy that I was in. And I guess the way the way I would have set it up last year probably would have failed, and so it's been fun to kind of work back through that and talk to um, talk to experts, get to know some people for that, um, and so like that's been actually a good thing. I was pretty mad at the time, but this isn't even on, is it? It is okay. Um, I was I was pretty mad at the time, but now it, it turned out to be a really good thing for me. Um, probably the reason we we did that when we decided to go and like to to pursue that. Um, I think it goes back, uh, where's, where's Amelie? She was talking, did I say that right? Right there. Yeah, so you showed a really cool graph earlier that talked about species diversity. It says, you know, even, even uh, monocultures with cover crops has very little diversity, go and, but then as you go up that curve, I'd like to be able to introduce perennial grazing. I'd like to really get into the, the diversity of agroforestry. So like that was, that was kind of the initial step. Um, you know, some of, the, some of the soil cycling or the nutrient cycling, the living roots in the ground, um, those things really came into play. Um, another part of it was economics. Um, so, you know, s simple chestnut math, if you can get 2,000 pounds of chestnuts and you can sell them for $4, which is a, uh, fair, like a fair assessment, right? So that's $8,000 gross, and I can gross maybe $600 on corn. Um, so the way I'm thinking of that is that's a value-added spot. Um, it's, it's a place for, um, not that, but my silvo pasture is a place for a launching ground so I can send cows out into, um, into my other, the other parts of my field, my row crops. Um, and the biggest thing is I want a spot for my kids to come back to the farm. 
Um, I, I, I realize that if they're going to do that, I'm going to need to make more money so they can come and be a part of that. And I call my, my strategy getting bigger by getting smaller. Um, if, I can take, if I can take small areas and make them intensely, intensely profitable, then I can then create a spot and a job for my, um, for my kid or from my kid. I've got three of them now. I'm so sleep deprived that I forget how many children I have. Um, <laughs> but I think then the last thing is trees are just really beautiful. I've been given a beautiful farm. Um, my grandpa's maintained it well. Um, he's kept it clean. He's kept it organized. It has a beautiful view over the backside, as Rob Myers always talks about all the time. And I want to take that next step in making this a beautiful place. Oh, and then one more thing. Sorry. I, I I talk too much sometimes. Um, I think like one of my big passions is the urban, um, the urban rural gap that I see is growing. Like people in rural areas have a hard time talking to people in urban areas. People, and, 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 it, and it crosses just urban rural. It's liberal and conservative. And for me in theological realms, like that, that, say, that same thing is there. And so I want my farm to be this place of intersection, to be a place where row crops, big farm, big industrial ag, can then turn around and meet small backyard permaculture production. So for me, like all those kind of come together in agroforestry. Wonderful. Thank you. I have a lot of follow-up questions, um, but I'm going to ask one more question of Debbie, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience here. Um, so Debbie, you farm along the Mississippi River, and my best friend farms in Iowa along the Mississippi River, and she deals with some fairly marginal soil, pretty sandy, low organic matter. Um, since you've started practicing no-till and cover crops, have you seen any tangible increases or changes in your soil test results or your yields? I know you mentioned yields. Um, but how have you how have you had that ex how well, has that experience been on we your farm? We have now our soil is gumbo. We have a we have a heavy clay. We do have some loamy soil. That's our best soil. But we, our soil right next to the river is is gumbo. Um, but the organic matter since we've been no tilling has increased from 1.5 percent to anywhere from four to five percent. So I mean, and we we use soil tests we a lot to make sure we're doing the right thing. And so. Um, now the the sandy soils are already in our county, and they're the west west part western part of our county. And I don't know I don't know wh what they do. I mean, they do a lot of irrigation and they do a lot of tillage. But the wind erosion is the biggest thing that I notice from the sandy soils. You know, you can drive along the highway when the wind's blowing and you can't see very well because it's, it's just blowing away the topsoil. But I don't know what you do. They need more tree screens, I would think. But uh, in our soils, we uh, we've we don't have that problem. Plus, we no-till. And we, we roll down the rye grass before we plant, you know, no-till planters and everything. So um, we don't see a lot of that, uh, that wind erosion. Or, and we, we don't farm right at next to the ditches, and so we don't see a lot of uh, our, our water doesn't go in the ditches and, and the fertilizer and the pesticides. So. Sure. I guess with the gumbo, then, if you have a heavy clay soil, do you see... Um, have you seen increases in water being able to permeate your soil? Yes, the NRCS has run several tests. They've come out and, and gathered our soil and put it in the, in the square wooden things and run the soil through it. And uh, it's amazing what, what, it can, what it can do. Um, the soil just goes right down. And, and our, I mean, we've noticed for sure that our crops do better in drought because they can go so much longer without, without rain. It's just, it's just pretty amazing. Sure. Thank you. Well, so I think at this time we can start taking some questions from the audience. Um, while we move around, I can also ask another question of all of our panelists here. Um, so Josh touched on this a little bit, but um, soil health management and s incorporating no-till or cover crops can sometimes be a slow return on investment or it's messy when you start out sometimes. Um, so how have you remained profitable or um, made sure that your farm is profitable as you convert to some of these practices? Well, we, for, for years, it just, two, just two people farmed 780 acres. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty profitable, and you don't have to have somebody on the tractor all the time. You know? And a lot of that, too, is because of the improvement in the herbicides that you can use to kill the weeds. But uh, that's one way it's profitable. Uh, and we... We didn't. We never intended to be farmers. We're scientists. I mean, I was. Uh, my husband is a, is a herpetologist, and I was an ichthyologist. So, farming allows us to do those things in our off time, and that's that's not profitable in money, but it's profitable in our lifestyle that we get to do other things. So, because we don't we don't hire anybody else, 
we didn't when we still farmed. But so that in that way, it's profitable to us. And Josh, you already talked about um, the chestnut crop and how that's going to help to make those acres more profitable for you. Do you have anything else to add to that? Yeah, I would say like in our row crop, in our row crop operation, we're pretty like we're pretty dollars and cents oriented. We know exactly what our cost of production is, um, so we can figure out return on investment. The best thing that that I can say to other people, to my neighbors, um, is that is the transition from corn into soy. Like we plant cereal rye at a decently high rate, um, anywhere from 50 to 75 or 80, maybe 100 pounds sometimes. And by doing that, we're able to then plant into that rye green. We roll and cramp after we plant. Um, and we're able to then, like we literally this last year had $10 in chemicals in our, in our herbicide program. Our neighbors, you know, we, and we had another spot just kind of as a control. So our neighbors had anywhere between 80 and 100 or $110 in chemicals, depending upon what they were using. So I can show right away a uh, savings of between 60 and $80 um, per acre on that soybean crop, which then, I guess, um, you know, and then on top of that, that, that allows for a clean, like a clean soybean field. I have some really cool pictures of very few, very few chemicals on a clean soybean um, field. And so, like it looks good, it saves money. In some situations, it yields better, um, as, as some of the research is starting to play out. Um, so I think like that, the soybean crop is definitely what allows me to pay for my cover crop habit. So, great. <laughs> gets expensive sometimes. Well, I, I kind of, I'm not like Josh. I don't really keep track of enterprises and all that analysis. I just try to have fun out there doing what I'm doing. And, and um, I, I try to balance, you know, making, I, so I can pay my bills and, and, and have fun and, and grow, uh, do these innovative things, what I think maybe are innovative. And so um, I think I'm building myself pretty quickly with this new rolling down these big cover crops and so on. Um, and... Um, but it's profitable as well. But I compare that to a, a lot of the Iowa farmers will grow rye and they'll, they'll kill it with Roundup at about this high. And I don't think they're really gaining much. And as a matter of fact, I know somebody who's done it for years and years and decades and his soil organic matter hasn't increased at all, which kind of shocked me when I was on a panel with him. And so I, I think that you guys are doing, doing planting in tall green rye and you're doing it um, conventionally. I think there's tremendous potential to do that. Just as an aside, in Iowa, maybe some of you have heard of our water quality problems in Iowa. Um, you laugh. Um, and and um, if you drive across Iowa and then across northern Missouri as I came down here, um, in the winter time there's no cover crops hardly. Iowa we have, we have 23 million cor acres in corn and soybeans and about 2% of that's in cover crops. And so you drive around, it's, it's bare and it's black, it's plowed. And so we're going backwards really. You know, we're, we're not gaining much at all. And so I think there's tremendous potential for farmers to be able to uh, be as profitable and use cover crops and, and, and make quick progress. The, the research shows that maybe in about five years you start to so you see some benefits from using cover crops. But I think if you, you really grow the tall cover crops, you can see the, the benefits much faster. And so we just need to, to just do it, I guess. Okay. All right, do we have questions from the audience? Start over here if there's a microphone. Yep, looks like he's coming behind you. I also approach life in a theological fashion, and my theology does not include the application of chemicals on the land because that has a, uh, uh, the, what it does, any chemicals kill the biological life in the soil. And so you may be uh, practicing better soil uh, practices, uh, but, uh, but you're undermining that whole process by applying chemicals. And uh, with, uh, I understand that when you roll down uh, grasses uh, in, in an organic fashion, you've got to make sure that that's thick and tall, as, as you've indicated, and, um, and, and then it will work. But if, it, if it's thin and scrag scraggly, as uh, was mentioned, uh, that uh, that roll down method uh, is a disaster uh, because the, uh, the the rye comes back. You know you've got to it's got to be uh, rolled down at a certain stage so it does not uh, regenerate. So that that's my comment. That uh, theologically uh, we're on the wrong path uh, by trying to solve 
uh, problems through uh, chemical applications. Well, I'm not sure there was a question there, but I know that it sounds like Josh has reduced his chemical inputs quite a bit. Um, I don't know, Francis or Josh, if you want to comment on the crimping. Just uh, you you're do. right about the fact that you need to do a good job with the crimping, and you need to have enough biomass to make it work, and you need to crimp at the right time. Um, but even sometimes I've crimped when I knew I didn't have enough biomass, and that's where I come to, you know, I, I'm going to see how it's going to work. It, some of it, I have some with a lot of biomass, and it worked really well. I knew it wasn't going to work as well, and I, I have a reduced yield, but I, I still pays for itself. And there, there are other things we can do. Um, I'm looking at now, um, if I can afford it this year, uh, there is a new company in, in the U.S. making uh, an electrified weed zapper. You can, you can drive down, it's about a 30-foot band uh, width, and, and uh, you can drive right about the, for example, the uh, soybean canopy, and it'll kill all the, it'll electrocute all the weeds that are taller than the canopy. And so if you do that twice, like a week apart, you can bas basically have a weed-free field. So there are some things we can do that are going to be on top of what we're doing that are going to help a lot. And so um, it's a constantly evolving thing. So and as to the, the theological perspective, I think that would be a really fun conversation for you and I to have individually, probably, because I'm assuming that was directed towards me. But yeah, I think, I think there, because like I would say the opposite. I would say that there is room for chemical use and like, especially, um, especially um, wise, prudent chemical use. But again, that's probably going to be something we're going to disagree on and it'd be a good conversation to have. I think we had a question here. Yeah, I have a question for all three of you. Um, if you all had to start over again today on your operations, would you do it the same way? Or what, what's the big bang that really got you all going forward, your biggest success? Debbie, would you like to start with this one? Well, yes, I, I would do it the same way. I would, I would have the same life that I have because it's, it's fun being outside, working with plants and animals all the time. And uh, we've seen so many advances in the, in the agricultural farming industry and, and livestock industry in, in my lifetime. And uh, I wouldn't do anything different, I don't think. I maybe started no-tilling earlier, but we were young. And, and back then, nobody no-tilled. You know, it was a, it, I remember the first time we went to, we went to Milan, Tennessee, to the a place where they, they, was, they were doing no-till for the first time. And it was mo mainly for s soil erosion. Uh, but we went several years in a row, and we were hooked on that. Not for the soil erosion part, because our land's flat as a pancake, but but uh, just for the you know the efficiency of it, I guess. Um, so you no, know, I don't think I would do anything different. But I, but I, I've enjoyed what we've done. Boy, what a what a good what a good question, Greg. Um, first of all, what was the Big Bang success? Was there like that was the first time that we planted? Um, soybeans into that cereal rye. Um, so a big part of my process was con um, convincing my grandfather that this was a good thing to do. You know, a very conventional farmer. Um, and so that started in the gardens. Like it would, I started kind of small in the garden seven or eight years ago, just u doing some small trials so that he could see it. Um, but man, that first year that we put that in and that worked and our field was clean, like that was the, like, and, and I think that's something that can be replicated across farms. Like that's, like that's a pretty easy one for, um, for corn and soy farmers to do. Um, and so like I was, I was really helped by a lot of people who kind of told me some systems. I stole everything from Dave Brandt basically. <laughs> like what I do is Dave Brandt, he's very organic-ish I think is what they call him. Um, and so in some ways I kind of got in late enough that I maybe avoided some of those early mistakes. Maybe I think what I would do is more personal. Sometimes I approach life through a very uh, um, arrogant Maybe, maybe I think this is, maybe I know this is going to work, and so we're going to try this. And I think maybe I would have had more sensitivity towards the farming practices and the history and the tradition that my, grand, that my grandfather brought with him. So I know that sometimes I cause pain and hurt um, in his life. So maybe it was more personal there. So, Well, um, I first started farming organically in 1975. Um, but I, I went to college first time and, and got a degree in music and philosophy in the late 60s, early 70s, and was a, a kind of a protester about everything. And so, so it was natural. It was natural that I was going to try to do it organically. And we had a lot of stumbles at first, but we learned a lot. And then I went back and became a soil scientist. When I was working at USDA in Washington, my brother was one of the early adopters of grazing for dairy in the Midwest in the 80s. And um, 
he talked at a lot of conferences and so on. So I kind of watched that. And then when I came back and bought this little farm in Iowa, I brought him down and he helped me set up my whole paddock system. So I started out with a bang right away, working really well. So that was very helpful. I'm, I'm one of the things that I'm curious about is um, how you interact with your neighbors and what are your farmer networks in terms of uh, receptivity and if you're seeing some change over the last few years. Since it's here, I'll start. Well, going back to 1975 when we started farming organically, we weren't perceived very well at all by my father and my neighbors and everything. And so it was, but it was okay. You got to have a thick skin. And so, um, but now in Iowa, we have the Practical Farmers of Iowa, which is not an organic group, but it has a lot of organic farmers in it, and a lot of innovative farmers doing tremendously, you know, interesting things. And so we learn from each other. We have an email um, system. Everybody's constantly emailing what's working and what's not working, if you've got a question. And so we have a tremendous support group. And you're going to conferences and hearing other people talk. So now it's different, you know. Now people, you know, like organic farmers. It's kind of unusual. <laughs> Um, yeah, so as, as usual, the answer to that question revolves around my grandfather. So he's been the guy that's been known for the cleanest fields, the cleanest soybeans, the most per the perfectly plowed and eventually cultivated, you know, other, other things, like the perfect fields. He's been the, um, the consummate farmer for 60 years in our neighborhood. And so our neighbors interact with us um, in a way that says, well, if you can convince Charlie Payne, that's his name, if you can convince Charlie Payne to do this, maybe we should think about this. Um, and it's been, been kind of interesting because the other farmers in our area, as opposed to, like in some places I've heard, they're kind of opposed to it. They say, well, if you can get Charlie Payne to do this, we'll try it. And so um, you see these little experiments cropping up. And um, like Susan's from my area over here, and there's, what, probably 70% of the people around have tried it. Um, have, have tried something, which is which is kind of a neat deal. So, it, it all goes back to Charlie Payne, I guess. I agree. We were the first in our area to do the no-till, and uh, we were right on Highway 60. And we we my dad went to the coffee shop, and he caught a lot of heat over that. He said, "Your son-in-law and your daughter are crazy. You know what are they doing? <laughs> they didn't think we could farm that way." But uh, with our science background, we thought we should try it. We we've, we've you know, we researched it fairly well, so and it worked for us. And and there are more n now in our area that are doing that. There's still a lot of tillage, a lot of tillage in in our county, but uh, there are more and more. Plus, the government's you know pushing it and helping it and everything else. So it, it's a uh, a lot of p farmers are hard people to to deal with sometimes. They're tough. They they think they know everything, and so it's hard to get them to change. But it's starting to change. <laughs> Can I throw one more? Like, my grandfather and I's favorite pastime when stuff's growing in our field is to sit at our table. We can see the road, because we're, we're on a major highway, and we will see people drive down the road, and they'll stop, and they'll back out, and they'll get out of their truck, and they'll take a shovel into our field, and they'll start digging around. <laughs> it, is, it is fun to watch, so. It's okay, it looks like we have another question over here. Yeah, it's, it's for the... The lady on the right there, Debbie, is that correct? Um, so you mentioned about planting trees, which is great. I'm a forester. That's my background. So I love planting trees. But you also mentioned that you have a lot of native stands of trees on one of your farms. Yes. But you're leaving that alone and not really managing it? Uh, we, we did the four stands put in the Okay. So I was just curious if you'd elaborate on that. Okay. And the other panel members could comment on that because it's sometimes interesting that people will plant trees but then a lot of times they don't necessarily manage their native forest that they have, which also has some tremendous value and potential through long-term management and sustainability. So just curious if anybody else wanted to comment on that, if you wanted to make some more comments on your long-term objectives for your woods that you have. Yeah, my grandpa got rid of ours, so I'll pass, them, I'll pass the mic down. Well, I've, I've got an interesting question. I've got about 125 acres of, of woods, but it was all logged out and it's all scrub. It's, it's not good, good stuff, so I need some help on that one. But as far as grazing, um, we do flash graze some of our creeks. We have a lot of creeks going through our land. And um, some studies at the University of Minnesota, at, at Minnesota, at DNR and so on, they found that y you can actually enhance the, the, the biological life of the stream by flash grazing. You stabilize the stream banks. You're in there for like a half a day. 
in the cows. They stabilize the stream banks, and, and um, actually they improve the aquatic life, which is kind of uh, surprising. And I do that at night. I, I flash graze at night, not in the daytime, because if you graze in the daytime, they'll lollygag in the creek. But if you flash graze at night, they'll, they'll graze the banks, and they'll, they'll lie down on the, out, out in the flat land, in the other land. So um, you, you, can, you can manage, um, you know, you can, you can manage it. Some people are saying, what? <laughs> Well, as a matter of fact, um, a friend of mine from Minnesota, he was at a restaurant, and he, he overheard some DNR people bad-mouthing the farmers for grazing in the creeks. And this guy had a really good system. And he went over to that DNR guy, and they had a big argument. And, and the DNR guy came out to his farm, and he said, and he showed him what's happening. And they started to study it. And they, you could see that where he grazed intensively, flash grazed, the bank was stable. It had grass on it. And, and, and then he studied it more and more, and he started to see that that segment had actually better aquatic life because of the way it had shaped the banks and so on, I don't know all the details, than others. And so they actually, you know, you can, you can do it if you do it right. Okay, what other questions do we have? Oh, we have one back here. This is a question to Debbie. Uh, <coughs> sorry. Yeah. So I know you have... You have been one of the pioneers in your region to start no-till, you said. And having a farm of 1,000 acres and going to no-till, I can imagine how much you have to first convince yourself to start that because yours is the breadbasket, you know, you're from the breadbasket. Okay, let, my question to you is you also said by adapting no-till, one of the being the innovators, you were able to build the soil organic matter from 1, point to two point, 1 to 2 percent? From 1.5 to... 4 percent, uh, you said. To 4 right? to 5 percent, yes. I mean, that's pretty impressive. And can you tell me over how many years you were able to build that to that level? By We've been no-tilling for 27 years. Oh, okay. So, but the, but the improvement, the largest part of the improvement was in the first six years. Six years? Yeah. Okay. Yes. That's good to know. Thank you. I would just like to mention one more thing before we <laughs> before I lose this microphone. We're uh, we're working with the NRCS right now on our cattle farm to, to plant cover crop in our warm season grasses. We think it's the perfect uh, venue for that because warm season grasses is dormant in the winter time, and so we're we're going to do a pilot program to d to try that. While we're waiting on the next question, Debbie. I was wondering if you could follow up with this and maybe Francis and Josh also, but what programs do you specifically utilize through NRCS? Can you talk about that? We've done it, we've done it all. We've done CSP, CRP, EQIP, Forest and Improvement. Um, we have, yeah, we have fenced out a lot of, we fenced out a lot of uh, areas around our creeks. Um, we've done it all. <laughs> We're um, we're working through the the cost share program, um, and then also equip for the, for the trees that we're going to put in, or we hope, right, Lauren? So we did some equip, but we put in um, lanes, stabilized lanes, and uh, one thing we did with equip is um, on the top, on the highest hill of the land, on our our farm, I put a, a four, six thousand gallon tank, and then we have a, a three acre creek, um, I'm sorry, pond below, and I put in um, a solar panel and uh, a pump to pump water to that tank and then it gravity feeds to all the paddocks. We've got 60 paddocks and we have a pipeline buried about, in each pipeline, about eight inches deep and so it gravity feeds to all the pastures. Because in, in southern Iowa we don't have good well water and the farms are basically on city water. We call it rural water. It's piped out into the countryside so it's very expensive and so this works really well. I have it oversized so it can fill that tank in one day and even when it's cloudy the pump runs it's a DC um, system and it'll run slower and it'll keep up to the cows drinking even in a cloudy day so that's one thing we do with equip that I think has been working pretty well okay great I I work with a lot of farmers in western Kansas and Texas and New Mexico and I know that questions about equip and other um, programs come up often and so if you have questions on those um, please feel free to ask these guys I don't know if there's going to be talks later on in uh, types of cost share programs or um, other things like that but it was a question I had, so I thought I'd ask it while we were waiting on other questions. Okay, are there further questions from the audience? This is for the Iowa farmer. Um, 
you mentioned about your livestock, your dairy herd, and your pasture. What species make up that pasture that you have out there? Well, it, it's basically cool season grasses and legumes. And I'll throw in things like chicory too sometime and so on. But um, I, I tried a little bit of warm season grass, and the problem is that fescue is, a, is a invasive. And by the time any warm season grass has got established, the fescue took over. And I, I would like, I know in, I in Iowa, at, univers at Iowa State University, they've done some research on grazing warm season grasses, and it's pretty good for, for beef cattle. For dairy, it's, it's not maybe as well. But um, so I basically have, um, have a mixture. I try to make it as diverse as possible. And then um, fescue tends to come in over time. And when I get too much fescue, I will um, winter the cows there. I'll do what people now call bale grazing. I put bales out, and, and every time I put bales out, I put them in a different spot. So th by spring, that area, the whole field or the whole pasture has been uh, covered with manure and, and, and residual hay. And now I've been trying to do it very intensively. I'll come in and I'll put bedding out. And I try to have that whole field where they are wintering covered with a layer of mulch every square foot if I can get it. And then I let that sit for most of the summer, and it kind of percolates, and it'll actually it'll kill a lot of the fescue. And then I'll come in like in the fall or out maybe midsummer, put in um, sorghum Sudan grass, and then I can graze that, and it, it'll soak up some of those nutrients too. Or, or maybe then after that, I can come in with rye in the fall, and I can graze that in the fall and in the spring as well. And so I try to keep it out of perennials for one year to deplete the seed bank of that fescue. And then I'll come back eventually, and I'll plant my diverse mix again of, um, of grasses. And then after th that treatment, I built the fertility up tremendously, and I, it got tremendous productivity after that. So that's a way to build my farm up piece by piece. Okay, I've got a, uh, another two-part question. Um, one, you mentioned, I think, in the beginning speech that you had like 60-some paddocks out there and you rotate the, the livestock every half day or something like that so they're into fresh grass continually. Did you, how did you build all those paddocks as, as far, did you have every fence builder in Iowa up there or, you know, what happened next? And it's very I, simple. Also, I got a question on that. You mentioned about the pond and the water and the solar panel, but you only had uh, it buried eight inches deep, and I'll guarantee you eight inches deep is not deep enough in the cold we had this winter. Right. So, so uh, how does how does that water system work too? Yeah, let's start with that. Um, I started in the spring, and it goes all the way to like usually November, and then I used to blow it out with an air compressor, starting one end and blow the whole thing out. Now I just uh, one one year I didn't get to it, and I it didn't freeze anything. I mean, it froze it, but it didn't break anything. It's polyethylene pipe. I was surprised. So I haven't been even blowing it out anymore because it's easier to fix one or two little breaks. But I don't use it in the winter time, of course. Yeah. And as far as the paddocks, um, I have three groups of cows going. One is the milking cows, one is the dry cows and bred heifers, and one is the yearlings, and they're all rotating in different places. And often I'll split those paddocks in half. They're about an acre and a half to two acres. And so when it's really growing well, I'll, c I'll give the milk cows, 90 cows, a half a paddock in the morning and the other half in the evening. And, and, um, but the thing is, in the spring, the grass grows really fast in this early summer, and then I need to rotate quickly. And so I'll take some of the areas and I'll make hay on them for, for winter feed. And then as it gets hotter and drier, the grass slows down. And so this is where people make, make a mistake with grazing. They'll, they'll start growing faster around. Each time it's shorter and shorter and shorter, and then they, that's where they burn their grass out. But what you have to do is add more area in. So then as it gets hotter and drier, I slow the rotation down, maybe like 30 days or 40 days or even 50 days, and then I, I graze further out. And in the fall, when it's cooler, I can graze. I usually have hay fields further back that are too far to walk, maybe like over a half a mile. But in the fall, they can walk that easily. So then I can extend the grazing season in the fall till like December by having some stockpile grass further in the back of the farm. Did I answer all your questions? Well, uh, I was... Fencing. Still had that question yeah, that on fencing. the paddocks. You yeah, know, yeah, how yeah. Did you I get just use paddocks, I huh? use 14 gauge wire and and little um, four foot fiberglass posts. So I can build fence really fast. I can build you know in in a day I could build the whole thing almost you know, and it's easy to I, they're they're basically permanent or semi permanent. But um, we can move things around if we need to. And then we also have some 
polyethylene wire and rolls so we can we can make temporary fences out in the back parts of the farm and so on. So we got it set up so we can build a fence pretty fast, but most of it's permanent, semi-permanent. Gotcha. Thank you. Do, thank you. Do we have another question over here? Does anybody have a microphone right now? What other questions do you guys have for our panelists? I think we have one in the back there. Has any of the panelists uh, try prairie uh, mixes for your cattle? Or in, and if you have a natural areas like that, because I know that sometimes the Department of Conservation works with landowners and they, um, they can um, hay prairie plants for, um, for a cattle. Just want to know if you have any experience. Well, as I mentioned earlier, I, I tried to plant some prairie plants and uh, the fescue kind of overtook it. But I, I, I'm not ready to give up. I, I think that I would like to try again um, and um, maybe I just need to get a little of the seed bank, get rid of the seed bank a little more first and then plant the prairie plants. And then maybe I could graze my y young stock in there, my, my dry cows and my bread heifers and so on, which don't need quite as high quality of nutrition. And, and so I could manage it better. Now, with, uh, what I understand with grazing prairie plants is that you've got to watch out. You don't want to graze it too hard or too early, and you don't want to graze it too, too frequently. So y you need to maybe let it grow more mature and then graze it like a mob grazing kind of system. I think maybe Greg would want to talk about that. <laughs> but um, so, so I think you need to manage it differently than what I do my cool season grasses because the cool season grasses can be grazed more frequently. So I would like to try it, but I, I haven't really done it. I just want to mention that they do it a lot in the coal in south, southeast Missouri. And there is a lot done in the, like in high lonesome prairie. I don't know, can you, can you hear me? <laughs> so so I ju there, are, there is a lot of experience, there are lots of experiences about that. And the Department of Conservation will have different uh, mixes. There, there are so many native plants that it, it maybe you can find your own uh, mix that works for you. Thanks. Yeah, you the, the warm season grasses, especially in Missouri, I think have a great place in any grazing operation. And that's because in July and August, you know, when it gets really hot and fescue lays down, goes dormant, you know, what are you going to feed your livestock? And so I don't think you want 100% of your farm in warm season grasses because you got to have something for you to winter, your cool seasons. But we have, with, you know, we've been doing practice grazing now, or managed grazing for 17, 18 years, and we're finding that the warm season grasses are starting to come back and reappear. And that has been come apart because of the way we're grazing, we're giving longer recovery periods. We're not coming back to that plant so quick. And so the warm season grasses have a chance to express themselves. And so we're seeing big blue stem. That's the biggest one. We're really excited about that. So. These are plants that are just coming out of the soil bank. We didn't plant them. So with you know, good proper grazing management, I think it's amazing what's down in that soil. We're even seeing it in forest where we're doing uh, agroforestry. We're going and taking some of the trees out and thinning them. There's big blue stem coming up in that timber. Now that tells me sometime in the past there was probably some prairie plants there. Thank you. I work in wetlands with incredible seed banks, so I can understand this concept. Just one comment I want to make, though, along with this, is that you graze fescue, and my Jersey cows will not eat fescue, period. And if I forced them to, they wouldn't give any milk. So um, with beef cows, you can do that, and so it's a little bit of a quandary for me. Do we have any other questions? Oh, here's another question here. Um, I hesitate to speak. I already spoke earlier, but... Uh, in the absence of anyone else, I, uh, I uh, my experience, and, and I'm not a, a technician when it comes to farming, but uh, I have th thrown some of the blue stem uh, prairie grass out into my uh, uh, fescue areas, and um, and since I refuse to use chemicals to kill that, um, I have noticed that the uh, the uh, Blue stem will crowd out the uh, 
uh, the, uh, um, uh, the fescue. And I wanted to ask uh, if you've noticed that effect. Uh, if you can get it started, I mean, it's, it's a, a, you know, a bit of a difficulty, but once it gets established in, a, in, a, in, in little spots around the, through the fescue area, it will, uh, it, 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 it crowds the fescue out. I'm surprised. I haven't seen anything crowd fescue so far. Yeah. And the problem I have with fescue is that the cows won't eat it, and so everything else they eat, and that grows up and makes a seed, unless I can control that. So I'm surprised. Greg, have you found out that? The, the yeah. Wow, that's exciting to know. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I have one here. Um, I noticed that you all were talking about using roller crimping to terminate your cover crops. Um, I, I don't grow row crops, but my father does, and, and he uses um, chemicals to terminate his cover crops. I was just wondering about the... Um, the transition and resources that you use to, to make that transition. Um, and you, you talked about how your costs went way down, but I was just wondering about other benefits. Yeah, um, so this is actually, I was thinking about Greg's question. If I had to do anything again, I would get a pull type roller crimper. So we started off thinking that we would put the roller crimper in front of our tractor um, and that we would then go plant and, and pull. And we tried that for one year, but we have terraces and we have curves um, and it just kept pushing everything, and it, w it became hard. And then um, I heard somebody speak at a conference that says that they, you know, so let me back up. So the problem with rolling and crimping is if you, um, if you roll one way and come back and plants up against it, I end up with all kinds of, um, all kinds of chains getting wrapped up, and it, it's real. It it becomes a problem quickly. And then I heard somebody say that they roll after they pl after they plant, and that changed the game for me. So if I had it all do, I would get a big roller crimper that I could, like a big pull type draw bar roller crimper. Um, and, and it works really well to go afterwards, like, is, is what we found to roll after we plant. Um, you know, what, what we've done, we actually, uh, we still use our roller crimper. Um, we put a sprayer on there, so we're able to spray as we roll. Um, so we put just a little, there's a little boom sprayer that I welded up on there. So um, that, was a, that was a good option that eliminates that other pass, so. Quick follow up on that. That's correct. That we found out too. We just we plant first, then roll. And um, what people have been finding is that you can wait till the soybeans are up about this tall and still roll, which kind of shocked me. And they say no damage. I mean, at the University of Wisconsin, they're doing it and they've studied it and they they say it works. So that gives you a lot of options. You can come in there and you can you can um, plant when earlier than before the rye is really at the stage where you w would roll it because you have to wait until it's an anthesis or flowering. And, and, then, and then I found that if you, if, you start, if you roll then, then it'll plug up your radiator because all that pollen and the flowers will just plug it very quickly. So, so now what we can do is we can plant a little bit earlier and we can roll a little bit, at, just a little after anthesis, after the flower's off. And then, and then um, or we can wait, you know, and the soybeans can come up. And you don't want to get them right when it's coming up with, with the crook or you break its neck, you know, the soybean. But, but so we have a lot more flexibility with that. That's so I haven't really tried that, but I want to wait and try it again when the soybeans are taller. Yeah, and the other thing that um, a lot of people talk about, and we actually saw some of this this last year, um, like the, uh, there's a vole problem. Like we had 15 acres that we like that they ate every soybean in our field of uh, like so we had to replant the thing three times. Um, but it was also the field that we didn't roll. Um, and there's a guy over here, Doug Peterson. He's going to talk later. He actually. Um, I talked to him a little bit. He's like, look, uh, voles like um, quail habitat. Um, you know, they, they like cover up top. Um, they like to have room down low. And so by rolling, we've actually found that we've had no vole pressure in any field that we've rolled. So we, like, we roll our corn ground. We roll our soybean. So we, we roll everything mostly to help protect against those voles. So now, th I don't know that that's been scientifically proven. Um, if you have questions, ask Doug. He's way better at that than I am. So... Do we, do we have more questions? Oh, the mic is coming. Uh, has anybody ever done any experimenting? I, I see some people starting to use the big row crop flame weeders instead of the herbicide for kill, for a knockdown on the grasses. Anybody done? There's a What's the name of that place down by Clinton? Um, 
it's between Clinton and Harrisonville, uh, a big company. They just recently kind of moving over toward more organic practices, and that's one of the things they make is a big, a big row crop flame weeder that will go between the rows. Flame weeders, yeah, yes. Um, they 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 flame the roll, right? And I I haven't used them, but um, they you can shoot right at the base of the plant like corn. And it won't kill the corn, but it'll kill the new weeds. You have to be, have small weeds, but you can flame weed. Like, I haven't tried it, but people are doing that, yes. If, if somebody would pay for me to try it, I would try it. <laughs> <laughs> Which is great, but, but I, I kind of like the idea of uh, the roll-down thing. And, and, and I, I, I did a, I've done a little bit, too, with planting hairy vetch and rolling it down, planting corn in it. And so I want to do a little more of that. The flame weeder sounds good, and it works, but... Then you got more, you know, fossil fuels, and all you're burning at your tractor, but you're all you're burning it behind you on the flame weeder. So, um, I look try to look at a little more of an ecological solution if possible. So I was told we could go a little past twelve. So um, I know we're cutting into lunch right now, but it's a long lunch, and so I've been told we're we're okay to keep going. So, are there any other questions for the panelists? just have a real simple question. I live in a city, so is there anything in particular that city folk misunderstand or anything in particular you'd want to tell us? Looks like Josh <laughs> wants to start. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, well, first of all, um, I, I, I live kind of a double life um, in my... <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of weird. Um, in, in my backyard, we live in town. My grandfather still lives on the farm. So we have this we have this wonderful permaculture food forest in our backyard. So we're experimenting with upper layer, mid layer, lower level stuff. Um, so that, I feel like that's a very urban kind of trend. Um, but my one of my favorite activities is to go strike up a conversation in Chipotle. I love to do this um, as a as a GMO corn and soy farmer, right? Um, and, and it's fascinating. Like I'll start talking to people, you know, because Chipotle is non-GMO, and I'm okay with that. That's good. Um, but I'll say they'll start talking about non-GMO, and they'll say, "Oh yeah, that non-GMO corn is grown without chemicals." And I'm like, "Hey, wait a second here. No, do you know what it takes to grow non-GMO corn?" Um, and so, like, like that's a really interesting that's a really interesting topic for, um, for me to be able to then go in and talk and inform and educate and do that in kind of a um, in kind of a neutral way. Um, I think the other thing that would be interesting to talk about it would be a good conversation to have would be the effects of tillage. Um, so, like, you know, like so, what Francis is doing as his organic farm is really good. He's trying to limit tillage and limit limit the amounts of that. And I've got a friend um, in Illinois who's an organic corn and soy farmer. Um, and he's he's tilling once every four years, but I think I think it'd be also to it would also be a um, it'd be an interesting topic to talk about the effects of tillage and, and the effects of, on the water cycle, the effects on nutrient runoff, and so on and so forth. So I, I don't know. You may be an urbanite that would know about those, but um, at the same time, I, I don't know that most of the people that I talk about don't talk about that. So Debbie, how about you? You've lived on a farm your entire life. What would you like to share with an urban population? Uh, <laughs> it's a different life. It's a different life, and I love to go to the city, but I, I always come back to the farm. I mean, it's a peaceful, peaceful life, and as I said, we spend 90% of our time outdoors, you know, daylight hours, so I wouldn't give that, that up for anything. There's something I think that's misunderstood, not only by urbanites, but by farmers and especially politicians. And, and in Iowa, we have this big nitrate problem, and the, the, the thinking is that it's because we have too much fertilizer, and if we can just optimize our nitrogen fertilizer use, we're going to fix the problem. And it's not that. And people think technology is going to fix it. It's not. It's an ecological problem. The problem is that the corn-soybean rotation is inherently leaky. It's inherently flawed, and people don't understand that because there are live roots in the soil for only about five months of the year. So during most of the year, there are no live roots in the soil and we have all this tile, tile drainage. And so when there are no live roots in the fall and the spring, the water comes down from rainfall and it percolates through the soil and takes nitrate, soluble nitrate with it, right to the tile drains because there are no live roots. Now, um, research shows that when you have perennial crops, good perennial crops, virtually no nitrate will escape. And so um, our politicians don't understand that, that they think that we just gotta manage that fertilizer better. The problem is we have, we have a flawed cropping system it's inherently leaky, so we need to do something ecological like cover crops or rotations in order to fix that problem. So, 
and until we're, instead we're doing band-aids and we're putting these bioreactors and these what somebody's called conservation diapers at the bottom of the field because uh, we haven't done it right on the, on the field. You know, our ecology is flawed, so now we have to use an engineering solution at the bottom of the field. That's my sermon for the day, and I'll be quiet. Are there any other questions? Well, can I, oh. can I throw something in there? Sure, go so ahead. Like, so Francis and I, um, I, we should go out to dinner sometime. That'd be kind of fun. Um, <laughs> I just invited you to dinner. Uh, too. Yeah, that'd be good. We can, <laughs> anybody wants to join us, we can go. Um, so, uh, but, you know, I would say that we, like, we would disagree maybe fundamentally on some of our practices, but I think the, the thing that I've found that has been, like, a common bond, um, if you will, is soil health. <laughs> Like, like, it truly does come down to, like, so what Francis is talking about is what we're doing on our farm so that we can help mitigate the, um, e some of the ecological Im impacts that corn and soy can have. I think there's some good opportunities there for, me, for like, me and other farmers like me to do that well. And I think what can't happen um, is we can't um, become these polarized communities of organic and non-organic and so on and so forth. And I think that, I think that it, happens, um, I think it happens too well, and I think soil health can really be um, can really be that bond for that. Uh, on, only at dinner. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I don't, we don't disagree. I think we agree on a lot. As a matter of fact, I would say that if Iowa farmers in that nitrate problem area farm like you do, we wouldn't have a nitrate problem. Are there any other questions? That was, that was kind of a very nice note to wrap up on, how soil health brings us all together. But um, if we have any more questions, we can still take one or two more. I don't see any. All right. Well, thank you. Oh, we do have a question. I was wondering okay. if you are working with perennial <coughs> grains that have looked into that. So the question was, um, are any of you working with perennial grains, or have you considered growing perennial grains as part of your rotation? I mean, I've, I've looked into it. Um, and like the, the yields are kind of low. They're pretty tight with their seed. Um, I would love to look into that in the future, especially as a part of my, because um, like, I have the equipment to do row crop, to do grains, to do cereals. Um, and so as I'm planting my chestnut trees and as I'm alley cropping, I think that would be a really good fit um, if that can then be proved to be an economically viable situation. I'm sure it can be. Um, so I would, I would like to try that at some point when that becomes available. But I don't know. It's not, I don't think it's there yet, so... Debbie, do you have any comments on this one? No. Nope. Okay. I don't know where Gregory's at. All right. So we will go ahead and wrap up. Please join me in thanking our panelists.